Good evening. I'm Tim McAdams. I'm the director of the Nanovic Institute for European Studies. I'm really thrilled to see all of you. And uh, uh, you know how it is with teaching. The students always sit in the back, um, and you have to prod them to come forward. So anybody want to come forward? <laughs> come on. Look at this. Here we have a model, a model student. We also have model adults. Uh, it really is great to see all of you. The uh, uh, Keeley Vatican Lecture is something that we're extremely proud of. Um, and, uh, you know, it occurred to me today, it's, it's funny how time passes. This is the 11th year of the Keeley Vatican Lecture. And uh, it's been phenomenally successful. Uh, it's really an institution at Notre Dame. And it stems from an idea that uh, one of our board members had, Terry Keeley, uh, a Notre Dame graduate, uh, which was that um, really we needed to do more to develop an understanding of the Holy See uh, at Notre Dame. That uh, really um, uh, the context that, that we had uh, we're not nearly as fully developed as they should be, um, and uh, uh, that uh, we could benefit from these relationships. Also, Terry's idea was that we could bring people from the Vatican Sea to Notre Dame to show them Notre Dame. Uh, because in fact, like many of us uh, uh, had not been to Rome, uh, even more, uh, people who work in the Vatican uh, and who care about higher education deeply uh, and been to Notre Dame. I remember uh, one person, uh, one of our distinguished visitors came and he said that uh, he'd grown up in Canada and he'd always heard of Notre Dame and prayed for Notre Dame on Saturdays because uh, the sisters wanted him to. And, and he always thought the Basilica was the place with the golden dome. And so he was so thrilled to come and learn otherwise. And so here we are in the 11th year, and um, we have a uh, really special uh, speaker tonight. And um, he, will be re he will be introduced to us by uh, someone who clearly has done more than anybody that I know uh, to build Notre Dame's relationship with the Holy See, and that's our 17th president, Father John Jenkins. Father John. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jim. Thank all of you for coming. Uh, I want to thank and congratulate Jim and the Nanovic for the Keeley Lecture, as he said. It's uh, become an institution and it's a, a wonderful occurrence here at Notre Dame and it reflects really the work of the Nanovic to bring to Notre Dame uh, lectures, events that bring the European culture and continent to us that are intellectually stimulating and challenging and in this case particularly advance the, the special Catholic mission of Notre Dame. So thanks to you, Jim, and thanks to the Nanovic. It's really my pleasure to introduce someone I call a, a friend, uh, Father Friedrich Bikina, the Vatican's Undersecretary for the Congregation for Catholic Education. Originally from Vienna, Father Bikina is a member of the Familia Spiritualis Opus, a religious community founded in Belgium in the first half of the 20th century. After studying economics and serving as an officer in the Austrian army, Father Bikina was ordained, I believe, in 1996. Am I right about that, Friedrich? Yes, okay. During that same, same year, he, he, he's just a kid, actually, not in 96, but <laughs> during that same year, Father Bikina earned a doctorate in theology at the Pontifical Gregorian University in Rome. His dissertation was entitled The Church as the Family of God and received the prestigious Bellarmine Award from the Gregorian. After years of pastoral work in, in Austria and responsibilities with his religious community, Father Burkina was named in 2001 an official of the Congregation for Catholic Education. 
His responsibilities have included the management of the congregation's international activities in the area of higher education, and he has represented the Holy See to various international organizations such as UNESCO and the Council of Europe. In 2013, Father Bikina was named by Pope Benedict uh, to his current role as undersecretary of the congregation. I would ask you to give the warmest Notre Dame welcome to someone who really is an important uh, church leader in the, um, in the Holy See, a good friend of Notre Dame, Father Friedrich Bikina. Dear Father Jenkins, dear Professor McAdams, dear colleagues and friends of the academic family of Notre Dame University, ladies and gentlemen. One of the most significant changes in higher education today, and I would say worldwide, is a shift towards what we could call student-centered learning. That means we should not emphasis too much in higher education on the input, not so much asking the delivery of lectures and information and knowledge, but that we should more look on the processes of learning. And therefore today, many would not even speak anymore of higher education and it becomes more and more frequent to speak about higher learning. That means that programs, credits, whatever, are not the important question, but the learning outcomes, what the student has learned through his or her learning experience in whatever setting. Within this context, I feel very much honored to be invited to this year's Terence R. Keeley Lecture at Notre Dame University. And first of all, thank you, Father Jenkins. Thank you, Professor McAdams and the Nanovic Institute for inviting me. But also thank you, Monica, for the whole administrative and organizational work you have done so wonderfully. But it is in a special way that I want to thank Terence Keeley, who cannot be here, but who sent me a very encouraging email some days ago, and I hope with whom now a personal friendship can also develop, for really thanking him for what he has done with this intuition and this series of lectures that have been taken place here. But I have at the same time to announce a fundamental change and shift in the format and outset of the Vatican Keeley Lectures, something similar to what I said before as the shift in the paradigm of higher education. In the past, important ecclesiastics, heads of the castories, eminent diplomats of the Holy See, like my friend Charles Brown, and all great personalities have been in front of you as masters in their area and teaching you a lot. This year in front of you, there is a learner, someone who came to Notre Dame to learn, to learn from great teachers, heroes and models of Catholic higher education. And I want to mention only one as an example and model for many others. Father Hesburgh, whom we can consider kind of a prophet of Catholic higher education. Like some other great prophets of his time in the Second Vatican Council, and I mentioned there Pope Paul VI as a pope, Karol Wojtyła as a bishop, and Joseph Ratzinger as a theologian. They shared some similar experiences probably in their life, like he did. And they were all prophets in their area. I'm here to learn, but also to share with you some lessons 
which I have learned myself during 15 years of service to the Holy See, mainly in the area of higher education, but not only, also priest formation and education as a whole, and to a certain extent also international diplomacy. All this, as the title of this lecture suggests, in the context of the higher education policy of the Holy See in the new millennium, or linked to three popes with an eminent experience in the field of universities, namely St. Paul II, Pope Benedict, and our present Holy Father, Pope Francis. I want to share with you some lessons which I have learned and we can learn from different parts. We can learn from simple reality and experience as well as from the signs and challenges of our times. We can learn from our own mistakes. We can learn from books and we can learn from great teachers. And all this together most prominently, we learn in a university where all this comes together. And I quote from a book, which obviously has been published by Notre Dame University Press, and this was one of my first experiences with Notre Dame, that I always discovered that books of high quality in theology often come from Notre Dame. It's the Rise and Progress of Universities by John Henry Newman with an introduction of Professor Catherine Tillman of this university. And there Newman puts this all together in saying, in the nature of things, greatness and unity go together. Excellence implies a center. And such, for the third or fourth time, is a university. I hope I do not weary out the reader by repeating it. It is the place to which a thousand schools make contributions, in which the intellect may safely range and speculate, sure to find its equal in some antagonist activity, and its judge in the tribun tribunal of truth. It is a place where inquiry is pushed forward and discovery is verified and perfected, and rashness rendered in notions and error exposed by the collision of mind with mind and knowledge with knowledge. It is the place where the professor becomes eloquent and is a missionary and a preacher displaying his science in its most complete and most winning form, pouring it forth with the zeal of enthusiasm and lighting up his own love of it in the breasts of his hearers. It is the place where the catechist makes good his ground as he goes treading in the truth day by day into the ready memory and wedging and tightening it into the expanding reason. It is a place which wins the admiration of the young by its celebrity, kindles the affection of the middle-aged by its beauty and revets the fidelity of the old by its associations. It is a seat of wisdom, a light of the world, a minister of the faith, an alma mater of the rising generation. It is this and a great deal more and demands a somewhat better head and hand than mine to describe it well. Such is a university in its idea and its purpose. But now, enough with introduction. Let's proceed to the very lessons which I have learned during my 15 years of serving in the field of higher education. And my first lesson I learned was a very practical one. And that means that according to Italian culture, the hour 150, 1.30 means 1.50 for 15. <laughs> Because the first, I started on Friday and the first Saturday I was there, I thought we finish work in 1.30, as it was told to me. And at 1.15 I found the congregation closed and myself locked in these holy rooms. 
I was fortunate that there was a good, a better undersecretary than myself who came then from his home to free me. And that's another aspect of Catholic high education. It has to do with setting free people. And we must not forget this ever. But now to the real lessons. First lesson, facts and basics. We go to the Holy See's high education policy. And I had a discussion when we tried to formulate the topic and I insisted that it shouldn't be the Vatican's high education policy, but the one of the Holy See. Do you know the difference? Of course, you know, you are students and graduates and professors of Notre Dame and they know the difference between Holy See and the Vatican. But just to repeat it in case, the Holy See is a subject of international law which has nothing to do, in a certain sense, with the very small territory of the Vatican, 0 0.44 square kilometers. And it comes, if we make the history short, from the time when the first diplomatic relations had been established at the time between the emperor and the pope. And this, at least in Europe, is the beginning of all diplomacy. But then when the Holy See in the 18 70s, so some years after the foundation of Notre Dame, or be more precise, when the wonderful basilica was constructed. At the very same time, there was a war in Europe between France and Germany. And as Germany won the war, <clears throat> the Fran French troops that protected the state of the Pope, which was a nice part of Italy, as they had to withdraw the uprising, upcoming, unified Italy occupied the state of the church and the Pope became prisoner for more than half a century. But then was the question what to do with diplomatic relations? Should the Habsburg emperor, should he remain as he was always faithful to the Pope or recognize the new upcoming Italy. A situation, I don't want to be political, but a situation similar like what happened in our days between Taiwan and mainland China. The Holy See has still diplomatic relations with Taiwan, recognizing them as the legal government of China. But this is not uh, all what we can say about uh, always getting better relation with mainland China, especially also in the field of higher education. And it is a good coincidence that both you, Notre Dame University, as we, Congregation of Catholic Education, are probably at the forefront of establishing better relations with mainland China. But coming back to my topic, the Holy See is the subject of international law, which the states of that time recognized to the Pope. So theoretically, the Pope can take his see, the Holy See, wherever he wants and put it in France. But probably one day, why not at the campus of Notre Dame? <laughs> I think it's a safe place in the modern world to announce the gospel freely. So, and depending on this, we have also the territory of the Vatican where we can put some offices but to, to give a simple example, if we speak of higher education in the Vatican, we would have two institutions. And if we speak of higher education institutions of the Holy See, we would have thousands of them. And there, there's a difference. But the fact that the Holy See, the Pope, and his central government of the Universal Church, which is the Curia in Rome, have this status, gives us a, a set of certain, I wouldn't call them privileges, but at least freedoms to act and to be present also in the world of higher education. Because the Holy See has its own higher education system as well as other states. We have a ministry for education, which is the Congregation for Catholic Education. And just directly from here, I will go to a minister's conference of European Ministers of Education in Brussels, where I can speak on behalf of the Holy See with the same length of 
time to speak with the same possibility like countries of Germany or France or Great Britain. So we have our own system of high education and there is an important distinction. When we speak about our system of high education, we don't speak about the Catholic universities because you are a real American, a real international university. And then we have what you would call the pontifical institutions. In your case, often seminaries. But all over the world, between 300, 350 self-standing institutions with around uh, 350, 400 affiliated institutions so that we end up with 700 degree granting institutions of that kind. And there you can study the so-called ecclesiastical disciplines, which is most prominently philosophy, theology, canon law. But there's also others, more specialized disciplines like philosophy, like communication, like archaeology, sacred music, and all these linked to the mission of the church to train so to say, our own personal to highest excellence. But then we have the great area of Catholic higher education. And it's sometimes interesting because we can speak for both. And that makes us stronger. Because we can speak for our own system, but we can put ourselves in the shoes of different countries. Because we are in the different countries recognized as national higher education institutions as well. And that's also an interesting thing. I said that the Holy See is recognized as a subject of international law. But uh, if you follow the rules of UNESCO, the international landscape is divided into continents, into regions. And the Holy See is the only subject in UNESCO that can be part of different continental regions, up to the point that in Africa the Holy See is considered to be African, as well as in Asia, Asian, as well as in Europe, European, and in America, American. And that brings us to an important point of the essence of the church, that the church is both universal as local at the same time. And this is just to give you some rough ideas for what we can do. And we present 1,500 Catholic universities worldwide with roughly speaking 6 million of students from the small associate and community college up to the top university like Notre Dame and even bigger in numbers universities like for example Belo Horizonte in Brazil with 70,000 students. So you imagine that this is kind of an educational empire which we have. Could make us proud, and we should be proud about what's going on. If you imagine six million students educated in higher education in this moment in Catholic institutions. And that's not the important thing. I, I think the important thing is they are educated differently. And this can change the world, I believe. And this is not the only activity the church has on the basis of these possibilities. We can also be member of international organizations, and some have been already mentioned. The Holy See signed conventions for recognition and academic collaboration in Asia Pacific, in, in the Western world, which includes both Europe and, the, the Amer and, and Northern America, as well as Australia, uh, Africa, Latin America, we are present in all these. We are present in, in continental initiatives like in the Council of Europe. You have probably heard about the Bologna process. That's the attempt of all European countries, 47 European countries together with the Holy See and the European Union who want to create a common space of high education where students can freely move, where study periods and degrees are recognized vice versa, where you tend to collaborate and develop a common approach with common values to higher education. And we had even for half a year, it was in 2014, the joy to, to chair the whole Bologna process. And we did a lot because something we found out, another lesson which I learned there, 
to succeed in these areas, you have first to be a good high education system. Like any Catholic university, first has to be a good university. But that's not all. We believe that because of our Catholic identity, we have more to offer. And something similar is, is true for us. We are members of this association and we try to work with them to opt for doing the minutes of a meeting, to run for the office of vice president and other things which are not always so interesting for the big countries. Because we learned another lesson which we learned is it is not often, it is not the question how big the country is which you are representing, but it's a question of engagement of the single person representing the, the country. So when I started in the Bologna process, for example, the representative of Luxembourg and the, one, and the lady from Georgia were much more influential than the representative of France because they were personally engaged. They were persons well educated. And this brings us already to another point which I want to make. It is not the question of numbers. Do you ask if you find a good idea how many people had this good idea? Or is it the good idea which counts? And if we are able to educate in our institutions people that have good ideas, we can ch change the world. Yes, we can, and we can it. Not, we are not to announce it, but to do it. And that's, again, high education of the Catholic Church. But I want to leave now these facts and basics behind and come to some principles which I want to share and which are also lessons which I learned during my time of service to the Holy See. One is that the church remains the same because she is able to adapt her mission to the circumstances of different times, of different languages, of different cultures. And that people say the two oldest institutions in the world, who are they? It's the church and it's the university. And why have they survived thousands of years? because they were able to adopt, to change when it was time for change, and to change in a way that they never lost their identity. And this, I think, is the great challenge for us in Catholic higher education, being always at the pulse of the time, changing every day, and at the same time remaining faithful to our long tradition, going beyond the opinion and the desires of the day, as Newman put it. The church remains the same because she is able to change and to adopt. And she is the same, one universal church in different languages, in different cultures. And there again is a similarity with higher education. Higher education becomes more and more globalized in our days. High education is less and less under the national legal or political influence because the truth can never be reigned by a party program or by a useless discussion in an electoral campaign. Therefore, even if states in their policy would fail, university has to offer some alternatives, because we are not bound to political programs. Even if there are no rectors are coming, and new education ministers, and new heads of accreditation agencies, but the university has its own rules, and is bound to truth, not to the opinion of the day. And on the other hand, it's the university that is ready to discover truth every day, and you, and in a different way. And so, just to give you some impressions how different high education is, what is the major emphasis in high education policy at the moment in Europe? It is to overcome the big differences of different systems. 
to see a transparent, in a transparent way how we can collaborate between the different languages, the different systems, the different countries, and to find answers for the challenges of policy in our day. And university becomes more and more important also for political issues, and we'll come back to this. In Africa, we have the great lack of resources and the struggling to face a growing population, to face an enormous richness of young people, of talented young people, but nearly no educational resources. And that there is the great concern of brain drain, the concern of talented young people from Africa that prefer to study abroad, but then also to re remain abroad. And therefore, most activities of the countries in Africa go to strengthen their own region, somehow to even protect the African region against other regions. We have the upcoming countries in Asia, and the desire of some Asian countries to play a more important role on, in international higher education. And you have great players like Australia, like China, like Korea, who have built up in the last years interesting and high quality higher education systems. And they want to engage in dialogue, but in a very competitive way with the other parts of the world. So whatever they are doing, it is to be seen somehow under the sign of competition. And you can continue to find these similarities and differences in international higher education policy. And in the midst of this, the Holy See tries to navigate, to understand what is different and see what is in common and play a role, which is based on solid work like all the others, but aware that we have to offer more because we got demanded to offer more. And if we would forget and would not anymore strive to offer more, then we would have mistaken and not fulfilled our mission. And from all this, I want to share with you another lesson which I learned. And this has to do with the principles I set for example, the change, and I want to share with you the change of strategy and higher education policy that took place within the last 15 years in, at the Congregation for Catholic Education of the government of the Universal Church. We could roughly say up to the year 2000, the idea, and I'm speaking now more about the field of ecclesiastical studies, but to a certain extent, you would understand that this was also applied to the field of, of Catholic universities. And then you probably understand better also some discussions we had 50 years ago. And they were also steered somehow from this place. Thanks be to God. The idea up to the year 2000 was we have to defend our Catholic identity. And that means somehow with an image to, be, to build a big wall around us that protects us from all negative influence from the outside. Especially in the field of ecclesiastical studies, it was the idea not to engage too much with universities, with other theological schools, with other developments in higher education. And more or less in these years, we, we discovered more and more that we are defending something that's, that we lose, that the identity is vanishing within the strong walls we have built around it. And that's, I think, something similar happens also in the church as a whole. It was an experience of the church in the same time that we will not survive if we just defend our faith. But the faith will survive if we are missionaries, convinced people who are able to take out the faith, engage in dialogue. And I will come back to a quote of last year's Keeley Lecture 
where the same tendency, the same development was pictured with regard to place of your certain place of your origin, namely Ireland. And the first step to, to get out of this protective wall was the, when, when the Holy See joined in 2003, the Bologna process, and engaged with the other countries, and learned to see our own system from the outside. It was a very important step for us, and that helped us also to develop other instruments that had been existing, like the international conventions, conventions for recognition and collaboration, bilateral agreements like concordates and other agreements between countries. And so within this time, for example, the Holy See was able to sign the first bilateral agreement with Taiwan, which was always a very delicate issue and nobody wanted to do uh, diplomatic agreements. But in the field of higher education, it's much easier. So we signed our first agreement in 2011 with Taiwan in the field of collaboration in higher education, assuring in this agreement that the Holy See and the Catholic institutions there are able to express the faith, even in a legislation where it's not legal to have theological elements in the, in the core curriculum or in the curriculum of another uh, subject in university. And by this agreement, we are now enabled to have this in our Catholic universities. And they recognized that the theological faculty, Fure and uh, Robert Bellamin of the Jesuits there, are fully under the legislation of the Holy See. And by the way, in this faculty, there is now hundreds of mainland Chinese theologians educated every year. There's another important shift in understanding. You know better than myself the whole discussion about academic freedom, if this is necessary for a Catholic university, and to what extent can it be exercised. And to be honest, for probably most time of the last century, many people, also in my position, would have seen academic freedom always as a kind of a threat, and they felt uneasy to deal with it. And they have considered it probably as kind of an attack when professors or university presidents quoted academic freedom. And sometimes probably it was also this kind of battle. But when academic freedom in the past has been seen as a certain sense or as a threat, it is probably now becoming the stronghold where the church can survive in the public sphere. It is a tendency, especially in Europe, that religious freedoms are less and less protected, and you have the same discussion in the United States. But academic freedom is well protected. And even if a church and a bishop and a parish in today, today's con European countries often are no longer a voice on the public sphere, universities, Catholic higher education can be because it's protected by academic freedom and good argumentation. And they say, look, we are free. What we say is based on evidence, on rationality, and therefore we can defend even values of our faith under the protection of academic freedom. And that's, that brings us back to what we have understand what academic freedom really is. It has to do also with the free choice of faith. Nobody can be obliged to believe something. Faith is an act, a human act of a free person. And the same is true for the discovery of truth. There's other great developments with the church in society which we could mention. And I want to quote something that Charles Brown last year said in the Keeley Lecture, but which I would say is not only true for Ireland, where he said, a society thoroughly Catholic in its cultural manifestations is a thing of the past. 
but in a not so paradoxical way, the disappearance of the societal supports and rewards for being a member of the church may well usher in a new period in which Catholics see themselves not primarily as representatives of an ambient homogeneous Christian culture, but as something different, as people who have freely accepted the liberating gift of faith in Jesus Christ and his church, the freedom of their decision to follow the Lord and to live their faith in him will be only the more evident because of the divergence the decision will entail with regard to the manner of life proposed by a secular Western European societies today. I think it's exactly this what we experience also in the world of higher education. Or as Pope Benedict put it in a famous speech during his visit to Germany in Freiburg, where he emphasized that the church must be in the world without being from the world. And there was a big discussion about it. But with this, he, point, he points out the importance of a church that serves within the world without adapting to the world. And this remains a challenge for us all. Also for the work we are doing, especially with these international organizations and in higher education policy. To be as the others, but also to be distinct from them. To offer something more, which we have received. There is another lesson which I have learned in these years. It is the lesson of the challenges of our times. What are these big challenges for higher education, especially in Europe, but I think also in other places of the world? One thing is a growing importance of university, also in the public sphere, for society, for politics, for personal and public development and well-being. In a more and more globalized world, the university, which is by its outset universal, gains more and more importance. We speak about a knowledge society and know that for today's economy, knowledge, entrepreneurship, what people are able to create, to investigate, to invent, is much more important than workforce or raw material. And so university becomes more and more important for economy. It becomes more and more important also in the field of diplomacy. I mentioned that we made the first agreement between the Holy See and uh, Taiwan in the field of higher education. But even if we have now again war in Europe between Russia and Ukraine, between uh, North Cyprus, Turkey, and, and, others, and, 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 and Greece and, 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 and Cyprus, and, and other areas in Europe where, where there is still situation of war and no, no peace. But all these people are sitting at the same table within the Bologna process discussing issues on higher education. And there is still student exchange between Russia and Ukraine. Imagine what that means for the future. And then we understand why Pope Benedict XV during the wartime and popes afterward said what we have to do after this war is to establish a union of Catholic students so that with a new generation we learn to live in peace together. And it is, I think, an eminent contribution of high education to peace in the world. Imagine how important it is that so many Muslim students prefer to study at the Catholic University to study at the public university because they feel themselves much more accepted with the, all their human dignity, with their religious belief than in other more secular institutions. And thanks to those institutions, Catholic institutions, which are as open as to welcome Muslim students with all their needs, including their belief. But we have to face great political challenges. The question of security, not only in Europe, is at, on top of the agenda. 
We face widening gaps in the social structure between educated and non-educated people. And even technologies that came up to say to open education for all like MOOCs turned out in the end to promote those who have better chances from their financial background, from their social background, and that the disadvantaged groups in society are not able to take advantage of these new technologies. And there we need the community college and the university where these people get personal assistance. We have the great problem of migration, which has to do with the demographic situation. I mentioned that we have areas in the world with strong young populations and low educational resources. And then we have the opposite. Look at Korea, for example. They are facing an enormous demographic problem in these years. And they know that within the next 20 to 50 years, half of their students have to be foreigners because there are no national ones. And they have a very developed high education system. And you can imagine that there is a struggle to get the best brain worldwide. And that big universities and, and countries try to attract students and bright brains from all over the world. But with what effect? To attract them, you have to open the doors, but then filter out what you don't need. And I want, do not want to blame anybody, but sometimes I have the impression that some European countries are happy that there is the Mediterranean, which is the big filter, and some would drown there who want to come to Europe. And they are able to select those whom they want to keep up our economies that cannot be kept up with those who have been born in our societies because there's a lack of births in this society. And we can ask, why is this? And Pope Benedict, who led us also into the depth of questions, pointed out that the question of demography is often linked to the question of hope. If there are no children, there is no hope. But on the other hand, if we are living in societies without hope, and real hope that goes beyond our earthly desires, then there will not be children anymore. So that's the political challenges in which we are, and we have to face them and find an answer. And there are three lessons which I learned also from great popes who had themselves eminent experience in the field of university. And in the title of this lecture we mentioned two, but I want to mention here all three. Saint Paul, John Paul II, Pope Benedict, and Pope Francis. And we see in their own lives how the experience at university shaped their life and their pontificate. We can, see from the, we can say that from university today, the society of tomorrow will depend. And if we want to change society tomorrow, we probably have to configure university today in a way that it prepares for this change. And so we can probably say also that if we look to the experience of university of these three popes, 50, 60, 70 years ago, we can discover what they did in their own pontificates. Imagine that John Paul II was able to teach at the only free university in the whole communist area. It was a place where intellectuals could keep a certain academic freedom and autonomy. Literally, it was the only the only free, academically free university in the whole communist area. And he was shaped by this experience. So his way of leading the church was a, a way into the freedom, escaping systems, totalitarian systems, opening for dialogue. His way is a way that led the church out. And I want to quote from his address to scientists and students in Cologne in the year 1980. 
For there can be no fundamental conflict between a reason which in conformity with its own nature, which comes from God, is geared to truth and is qualified to know truth, and a faith which refers to the same divine source of all truth. Faith confirms, in fact, the specific rights of natural, person, of natural reason. It presupposes them. In fact, its acceptance presupposes that freedom which is characteristic only of a rational being. This shows at the same time that faith and science belong to different orders of knowledge, which cannot be transferred from one to the other. It is seen furthermore that reason cannot do everything alone. It is finite. It must proceed through a multi multiplicity of separate branches of knowledge. It is composed of a plurality of individual sciences. It can grasp the unity which binds the world and truth with their origin only within partial ways of knowledge. Also philosophy and theology are sciences, limited attempts which can present, represent the complex unity of truth only in diversity, that is, within an open system of complementary items of knowledge. And if I say to you the experience of Pope John Paul II was this question of academic freedom, of free reason, of free faith. It was the experience of Pope Benedict after the experience of two world wars in which Germany was heavily involved and where they tried to find a new access to truth, to go into the depth in a way, in a, in a world that had become super, superficial putting the political opinion at the place of truth. And this is totalitarianism. And so we understand why Benedict then went into the depth of the problems, never stopped with one question, but asked the question, why is it like this? A typical attitude of university, showing how to rediscover the most important essentials of our faith, which is love, which is truth, which is faith. And we can take part in this enterprise by asking these questions, by opening people to ask these questions. And I want to quote as an example of this attitude, and he, makes himself, he, he himself makes reverence to his experience at university when he addressed some university teachers during the World Youth Day in Madrid. Being here with you, I am reminded of my own first steps as a professor at the University of Bonn. At the time, the wounds of war were still deeply felt and we had many material needs. These were compensated by our passion for an exciting activity, our interaction with colleagues of different disciplines and our desire to respond to the deepest and most basic concerns of our students. In truth, the university has always been and is always called to be the house where one seeks the truth, proper to the human person. Consequently, it was not by accident that the church promoted the university, for Christian faith speaks to us of Christ as the word through whom all things were made, and of men and women as made in the image and likeness of God." This lofty aspiration is the most precious gift which you can give to your students, personally and by example. It is more important than mere technical know-how or cold and purely functional data. We need to recognize that truth itself will always lie beyond our grasp. We can seek it and draw near to it, but we cannot completely possess it or put better truth possesses us and inspires us. In intellectual and educational activity, the virtue of humility is also indispensable since it protects us from the pride which bars the way to truth. And the third lesson we can learn from great teachers as our popes in our time are, is Pope Francis. He didn't study philosophy he did also study philosophy, but it was not his first degree 
with, in the case of John Paul II. He was not uh, such a great theologian as Pope Benedict. His first degree was in chemistry. It's hands-on. It's dealing with earthly reality. And we learn from him to engage with this world. As he said to university peoples, don't watch and judge the world from the balcony of your scientific experience. Go down, mingle. Bring down what you have learned at university and make service out of it. Or his definition of education, which he has in several occasions put forward. He said, education, what does it mean? It's like learning to walk. And how do you walk? With one foot in the zone of security, anchored in tradition, in doctrine, and what you know already. But that's not enough. And if you remain with both feet in the field of security, of protection, you will never move forward. So education is to learn, move forward. Put one foot in the zone of risk. That's learning. That's education. And we should always have the courage in our universities to go forward, anchored in our traditions, anchored in our values, in the safety of knowledge, proved knowledge, but at the same time always moving forward in the zone of risk, never with both in the same time, then we would fall down. This is the definition of education. And so you see that all what I try to explain you, the lessons I learned, are somehow put together in a synthetical way by these three great popes. With John Paul, who said, go out, go into the freedom. With Benedict, who told us, go into the depth. And Pope Francis, go into this world, go to the peripheries, engage, mingle, be missionaries again. And another point that unites all these, and this is which, what, which I want to finish, it's the theme of hope. They all, in their way, showed us that the world will not develop to the better without hope. And I think if we would ask ourselves, what is the reason for the great problems of our days, I would say it is a lack of hope. And we have to ask ourselves, are our universities, are our Catholic universities places of hope? Every university is a place of hope because it's a place of young generation. And no one would do research without the hope to find something. So these attitudes are in a certain sense already the same in a verbi, the preparation of hope. But it's not enough because we have students who have studied the best places of the world. And there's people with Oxford degrees who fight for the Islamic start State in Syria. And we have to ask ourselves what kind of education did they receive? Highly professional, preparing for a wonderful career. But this kid said, that's not what we are looking for. We are looking for more than a career than a good job. And Catholic universities are those who should provide this more. And I would call this more hope. It is the place where we open beyond these earthly realities. And it's mainly Catholic identity. It's the presence of philosophy, of theology, of subjects that look beyond a good career but prepare people to be people who make decisions, who become not politicians, but statements, who will be able to change the world to a better because they have encountered at their time of university, like all three popes did and so many Catholics and non-Catholics during centuries, in Catholic universities because they encountered hope. And hope has a name, Jesus Christ. And we should never 
cover up this name in which all hope is from our students. This is our mission, and this is why Notre Dame, I think, is among the best universities of the world. And thank you for this. We, we have time for a couple questions. Uh, some of you, many of you will already know that it's the custom of the Nanovic Institute uh, to begin with students. And so I would be delighted to take a question from a student. I had already very good questions this morning from some students. Some are here, but great. Yes, sir. So you mentioned a few things having one foot in the secure side, one foot going forward, and having the sort of basics of the uh, past and, and tradition. And we've seen that, of course, in, in Catholic education throughout the Middle Ages, throughout the Renaissance, and later on with core curricula, philosophy, etc. Is there a program that the Holy See advocates, or is there a program that fights for, in any sort of curriculum sense, of, you know, these are the books that people should read, these are things that you can have later, is there, is there anything concrete other than we should read the great traditional books? You know, we can say that people are, you know, this is an educated person, this one is not, but uh, some of the people that we call educated today also believe that all Catholics are fundamentalists who, who can't agree with evolution or else they're heretical. And they would sit there, they're college graduates, they're intelligent people that don't have, you know, these basic understandings of First of all, thank you for this good suggestion, and I think it, it's, it's, it's worthwhile to think about. Uh, I have to admit we have no, in that sense, no standard core curriculum, but look at what I said, this, this great diversity which we have worldwide, and a core curriculum can, can never be the same depending where you are. Uh, having said this, I, I have to say, and this is not to make compliments, but uh, having visited Catholic universities in different parts of the world, I think they are doing quite well in this. And, and what you mentioned, a good core curriculum, liberal arts education is definitely something which we need. Uh, but there, we had this discussion, for example, when, when there was the idea to set up a, a liberal arts college in, in Hong Kong, uh, and, and there was the question, should we uh, design a liberal arts question according to the American model there, which would sell probably for the Chinese because they like American higher education. But in the end, we said, no, that wouldn't be the way. We should design a core curriculum and a liberal arts education based not only on Western tradition, but also including the old Eastern traditions. And you. I don't know if, how familiar you are with East Asia, but the, the evangelization of Korea was mainly taking place with the book of uh, Father Matteo Ricci, in which he explained that the, the, the highest fulfillment of, of the philosophy of Confucius is Jesus Christ. So I think in the, in the Eastern tradition, we would have to have a liberal arts education where we also look in the same in the same free way uh, like Matteo Ricci did it and, and, and others at that time. And, and I think, but this is a, a, a thing where we also have to see subsidiarity. I think we can encourage universities, networks of universities to, to develop these, these programs and to offer them. And my dream, my great dream, is one joint degree in liberal arts education among all good Catholic universities, or at least we can start with some of the flagships like Notre Dame here, Furen in, 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 in China, in, 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 in Taipei, or uh, Catholic University of Australia, or, or other great, great Catholic universities, that they would together offer a joint liberal arts education where students can say, okay, I want to study one year in a more 
Western tradition in the United States and one year in a more Eastern tradition with certain similar, similar elements, with certain similar learning outcomes, we have the instruments today to, to make these things transparent. And I'm dreaming from the day where we can set up such a program and students can go from one continent to the other and, and, and have a, a good uh, liberal arts education that includes all these tradition and in the end shows that the church is able to ha handle them all in our Catholic spirit. Hope this is an answer to your question. Please. Yeah. I'm a fourth year student in, uh, in the theology program. Um, my question has to do with the phrase that St. John Paul uses in uh, his Ratio when he speaks of his, his uh, longing that we would learn to please Sofare in Maria. And I wonder if there are some examples where that kind of a dream of his or like, <coughs> certainly here from the things. Yeah. Yeah. First of all, what do we mean in philosophy with Maria? That, that's a good question. And one, again, if you would look at the three popes, you would have different emphasis, but in all of them, you would find this back. And I would start probably it's a bit provocative. I was a little bit disappointed because there was not, that's a bad word, sorry, but <laughs> I, there was no ba gender balance in my, my being here. And I have not seen enough women during, during my, 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 my talks here. And I think this is something. Also in, in, in university, also in theology, in philosophy, the role of women. Also in our, in our, in, uh, in our church administration, in, in, in the Curia. And, and I can tell you that my successor, thanks be to God, the one who is now head of office for international relations, is a, it's a consecrated lady. She, she, she was coming from the diplomatic service from Germany and is, is now serving for the Holy See with roughly, say, 15% of the salary she had before. <laughs> but with much more enthusiasm. Uh, but that's to say this could be something, the, the female element within theology, within philosophy, within university. But I think Mary is not just, not just a woman. It is, it is much more. Another point, what, what means, I think, is this this receptiveness, this openness. And this brings us to what Benedict said. The first, what I said to you, this strengthening the position of, of female persons in university, in the church, this would be very much Pope Francis. Then we could find in Pope Benedict uh, this attitude, if you, if you remember what I quoted, this attitude towards truth. Not we possess truth, but let us ourselves be possessed by truth a receptive way. And I think uh, nobody can be a good teacher, a good researcher, if we are not able to listen first, to, to have this attitude also of admiration, to be to, to in, in front of the truth, which is always beyond our capability. This would be probably the attitude of, 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 of Benedict to see this. And then you see that a deep personal relationship to Mary of Pope John Paul II, which, which had, had to do with trust and confidence, so that he, he had no fear and, 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 and was able to, to face so many challenges in his time. To be somehow confident in, in, in the providence of God, and I think this is another, another element which we can learn from Mary. So I don't know if I have answered your question, but I would say these three elements, according to the three popes, we could try to strengthen. We have time for one more question. Here, yeah, yeah. Um, a similar question about what do you think it means for the church to be anchored in tradition? Um, uh, and that's the place that uh, the Holy See accords to Latin in its education, whether whether it reads or it seems that the church has been pretty clear in the Code of Canon Law or in the encyclical Federal Sapientia that um, Latin has a pretty intrinsic relationship to the very tradition that, that we've talked about, uh, of philosophy and theology. Um, but it seems like in so few places there's sort of a willpower to 
uh, enforce the curriculum, to, to demand high standards of Latin. Um, so uh, so I'm wondering if, if, if you consider that a problem or if there's any efforts right now to improve that. I think the first thing to be anchored in tradition is that you know the tradition. And this is the, this is the challenge often. Because uh, you have to know it and then you can engage in dialogue with the tradition and, and you see what is, what is the, 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 the fundamental truth that doesn't change and what is the way of expression. And I think without, without a, a basic knowledge of Latin, at least in, in areas of philosophy and theology, you don't have access to the tradition because you cannot, you cannot just study in, 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 in translations because translations always are interpretations and then you end up in an interpretation. But this is exactly not what you should do. You should go back to the, the sources and, and that's, I think, that's the, the, the main importance besides of the importance of creating this kind of unity in, uh, in, the, in the community of the church in the liturgy, that, that people should be familiar at least with some liturgical texts in Latin to be able to celebrate together. Um, on the other hand, for example, in, it's in, the, in the world of higher education now, English is the, the lingua franca with, with a modest knowledge of, of English as I have, I can well survive in most of, of higher education meetings in the world. Uh, so English in a certain sense has a function that in the past has la had Latin. Uh, but on the other hand, it's also we, we have to keep up the, the languages, the, 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 the plurality of languages. It would be a shame if there would everything be taught only and researched in English because it's also important for a national language, even for a small language, to have theology in its, its own language. I think it's important to have at least something in, in Gaelic uh, Theology we, also. We teach Gaelic. Yeah, therefore. <laughs> I know to Notre Dame to learn Gaelic. Uh, wow. Well, thank you very much. And um, we now have time uh, to make a presentation uh, from Father Jenkins and then Anna, the Anders, you should have been uh, all uh, And the artist uh, oh. as a memory of your visit. Great. Congratulations and thank As you. you can And I give you my short interpretation of this, of this <laughs> yeah. work of art. If I look out of my window at my office, I see this cupola. And if I close my eyes and then look in what I, I will see this one now. <laughs> That's Catholic high education. So thank you very much, Father Bacino. Thanks all, to all of you for coming to this fabulous lecture.